ladies and gentlemen. The, um, the subject of the conference, uh, the common, could be restated in terms of the forthcoming Venice Biennale, the subject of which is common ground. For me, I could call it one aspect of the interpretation of the word public space or infrastructure. In the end, it comes to the same thing. A vitally important concept, something that for me has fascinated me since I was a student at university, and in one sense, I still feel very much a student in terms of learning about this critical subject. Public space can take many different forms. It can be transformed by celebration. It can be transformed by religious pilgrimages. It can be a humble market, a gathering place. It can be the center of a small community. It can even be a fairground. It can be an intersection in Shanghai, a street corner where people bump into each other and exchange. It can be more formal in terms of an arcade in London, Burlington Arcade. It can be on a grand scale, conceived, the civic order, St. Mark's Square in Venice. It can be the great um, connecting Galleria in Milan. It can be a park, a green space. It can be an intersection in an Asian city. It can be, again, grand in Renaissance terms um, in Rome. It can be a gathering point in a favela in South America. It can be a point of political change in terms of the Arab Spring. Who'd heard of Tahir Square until a few months ago? It can be a park which is a point of political uh, rebellion in New York. It can be a crossing, a vital extension of the public realm, not just static spaces. If we think about what infrastructure really comprises, it's very much about movements, it's about crossings, or it can be in this Thomas Truth image, um, this scene in, in Tokyo. Um, if we go back to the middle of the 18th century and Nolly's uh, portrayal at that time of what constituted the heart of Rome, what I would suggest is that the white spaces, which are the spaces between buildings, those are the common ground. That's what we're really talking about. I would suggest that the design of those spaces is more important than the black areas, which are the individual buildings. That doesn't mean to say that as an architect, I'm not passionate about the design of buildings. Of course, I have to be. I'm driven by it. Um, but more and more over the years, and I started as a student with a passionate interest in civic spaces and charted them as a, as a, as a student traveling around the world on, 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 on scholarships to, to explore and to, to, to research. If you think about the quality of a place, the identity of a place, it is about the public realm. And all of those spaces are designed. Um, they may not have a named designer. It may be a bureaucrat. It may be a village elder. It may be an engineer, an architect, but they are designed sometimes brilliantly, sometimes badly, but they serve society, and they're inseparable from society. They also have a very real relationship to issues of sustainability, especially in the context of rapid urbanization in those emerging economies, where we're seeing 200,000 people a day moving from the countryside into the city uh, in search of more liberation, greater freedom, emancipation, um, and more prosperity. There are simplistically two models about how those new urban settlements, um, uh, the form that they might take. One is um, traditional, the one on the right, Copenhagen, um, and you can compare it with Detroit, which is a relatively new model in terms of being car-borne. It's dependent on the network of roads, transportation. Um, 
In the relationship between density and sustainability, Detroit has half the density of Co Copenhagen, but consumes 10 times the energy measured in, in gasoline. Um, so certainly one very recent model, but I would suggest already discredited, and, um, and reinterpretations of the denser, more pedestrian-friendly uh, European city being a potential model for the future. It's interesting to see in the way that China magnifies a lot of these, these trends. And um, as an emerging economy, it's quite interesting that statistically it is the site of the world's biggest traffic jam, which happened in August 2010. It, um, it covered 60 miles, it lasted 11 days, and 10,000 trucks were involved in it. Uh, quite an interesting um, model. It's a reminder also that 70% uh, of the energy that we consume in an industrialized society um, uh, is really between, is, is, is by buildings and the movement between buildings. And the graph here, um, uh, if I say that the uh, energy consumption rises with the arrow on the left, so a city like Detroit um, consumes a lot of energy. It is, if you track down to the, um, um, to the indicator at the bottom, which is about density, it's very, very low density. And right on the right-hand side there, Hong Kong, um, because of its mixed use, its high quality of public transport, pedestrian-friendly, high-density social diversity is very low energy consumer and highly sustainable. Of course, one could take other examples. Manhattan itself, the peninsula, um, is also a model of sustainability and a very, very pedestrian-friendly, a very, uh, with Central Park as its green lung at the heart of the, uh, of, of the city. The indicator at the bottom there is in terms of the quality of life that, um, that, that such cities can deliver, being sustainable, um, is very much about public space. And I'd like to show some examples from our work going back, starting in Hong Kong over a period of about 33 years, and try to convey through one aspect of those responses to the context of the city structure and the way in which they have tried to respond, they have tried to give something back to the city, tried to raise the standards of the city, not inward looking as a building in isolation, as an element of sculpture, but really interconnected with the social fabric of the city and, and, and very much in that spirit of urbanity, of public space, and, and of the social dimension. Hong Kong, it goes without saying, is a very dense, crowded, packed uh, city. And one small green space there is Statue Square, which is at the, head of the, at the head of this space, is the site of our Hong Kong Bank, which was a competition in 1979 and open to the public um, as a banking hall in 1985. What this image does not show is that right at the beginning there was a decision to lift this building up and to continue the public domain under the building. So as you approach it, it becomes welcoming. The banking hall is not an intrusion. It floats above. If you look at some of the early sketches, early sketches here where I was indicating the possibility of gliding uh, upwards uh, through a kind of glass underbelly to the banking hall so that the ground would be free for pedestrians. This is an early diagram showing how that building is lifted up and sunlight is reflected down onto the space below. And this is the glass underbelly of the banking hall. What is interesting is that every Sunday, if you looked through that glass floor onto the public space below, this is what you would see an extraordinary colonization. This space is taken over by the Philippine community. 
by the ladies who serve the families uh, in Hong Kong who are highly um, articulate, intelligent, they're mostly university graduates, they move to Hong Kong because the standard of living is higher and they can send their savings back to the families in the Philippines and every Sunday they celebrate in a way their national identity and what is interesting is there is a kind of self-ordering here the sort of ordering that you will find in a favela so that when a favela is eventually in some instances transformed into a permanent settlement then there are certain grid lines, there are certain geometries, there's certain orders. So that transformed favela doesn't look any more like a favela. So there is a very interesting kind of hidden order. And then come Monday morning for the remaining six days of the week, it is very much a civic space. If I fast forward 30 years on and look at another project, across the water from that bank. In other words, if you looked out through that bank, through the windows, you would see across the water West Kowloon. And this site here, that site there, ringed, is the site for an extension of the city. This was the subject of several competitions. We competed three times for this project, and the third time, well, we won it each time, but hopefully this will be the last competition. Um, it's a competition for <clears throat> a master plan and a combination of buildings. What was interesting, and we had great difficulty in communicating this um, to, to the jury, to the public, was the, um, that this, as a master plan, was an extension of the city. It was not about the design of individual buildings. The reason why I concentrate on this is that I find it very, very difficult, even with my architect colleagues, to get an awareness and a sensitivity to the importance of making spaces as streets, from learning from how traditional streets, um, routes, boulevards, alleyways, whether they're tight, whether they're pedestrian, whether they have traffic, what is the DNA of a city and how do you learn from that? How do you create outside spaces? And I think that the problem is that as architects, we are educated and brought up to think of the building as an individual act in itself, not locking into the wider city. I think this building, incidentally, is a brilliant way in which it engages with the, with, with the city. It's not just an object in space. It's very much about a space-making building, but that's another subject. To come back to, to this, the brief was for culture. It was very much um, around the clock, 24-hour community to be made. What is interesting is that you see not only in the red, a very strong mix of culture as a driving force for this um, new extension of the city, but in our interpretation, um, a huge amount of open public space, whether those are paved spaces or whether it's a great park. And, um, and we went back and we I sought to identify, to try to find what makes the key spaces, whether it's Nathan Road here, which is emblematic of Hong Kong, or whether, which I'm not going to show you because limit of time, but if you peel off, if you turn right or left off this street, you will find a maze of narrow um, uh, pedestrian alleyways and the combination of these spaces. That's what makes Hong Kong. Can you analyze it? Can you dissect it? Can you? We attempted to do that um, through um, through research, we discovered that the layering, the way in which the shopping would go upwards, offices above that, residential above that, would be quite special to, to, to Hong Kong. And then we analyzed the visual field. What proportion of the space, when you look, is signage? Signage is a very, very vibrant aspect of that. How much of it is traffic? And, and how much of it is sky? How much of it is the architectural fabric? Could you dissect that and could you take away the thing that everybody hates about that street and that is the pollution of the traffic, the hazards of crossing a road. 
Could you have all the good things and could you address some of the more problematic things? The final translation of that was our competition submission. And interestingly, this image starts off with the public space. And the spaces which are either side of that, which are about the museums, the theaters, the opera houses, those are secondary to it. Some of them are freestanding in a park-like setting. Some are embedded in individual buildings. But what you see here in this, and there's another aspect to this project, which is its sustainability. It is a zero carbon, zero waste. is made possible by the research that we did on another project, which I will end with, which is Mazdar. But you can see that the, that the heavy, polluting, uh, disturbing traffic is below a deck. That doesn't mean to say that we don't bring the pedestrian realm to life with, with taxis and so on, so that you do have the convenience of being able to uh, have shopping collected at the door and so on. If we pull back and we look at it in the context, here's the Nathan Road area, the big vertical line being the main road, and then off it, those little side alleys that I talked about. It is the, um, that is the inspiration at the bottom for the, for the new project, the, the master plan. Here are some visualizations of how that would look. The small side alleyways that I alluded to in this instance uh, covered here in terms of more around the year, but there'd be a variety, quite a lot would be open to the sky. And then looking very much more at detail, here you can see very, very clearly the grid. You can see those buildings where the cultural elements are embedded in the fabric and others which are more sculptural, freestanding, and they relate to this great park, a huge park. And again, the decision on this, and I think this is an interesting move and one that we're seeing more and more, um, the decision was a, essentially a public decision. There are a number of exhibitions, there were voting rounds, and, um, and finally it was the, the public who played a major role in the selection uh, of, the, of this scheme. And here's some visualizations of that park. Very important contributory factor in terms of the trees, their ability to absorb carbon dioxide, um, bringing natural species that would be common to the area. So again, a park that would be very Hong Kong in its feel and could not be confused with a park in another city uh, in the world. Um, one of the projects that was very important um, in, in, in the past, in terms of uh, the wider urban context, was a very small competition for a, a project in Nîmes in the south of France. Uh, this is going back to 1985. It's uh, coming up to its, uh, its big anniversary next year, in terms of when it opened to the public. And, um, and this is the, um, the wonderful Roman temple which was facing the site of the competition, which was occupied um, at that time by the ruin of a 19th century colonnade for an opera house that burnt down um, uh, some years earlier. And, um, and this is what I describe the dark tunnel that leads to the space. And before the, um, for the selection of the competitors, everybody was invited to, to visit the city. And I visited the city kind of incognito, nobody knew that I was there. I came very much as a stranger. And I sketched, and, um, and I noted the things that excited me about the place. And they were all about the infrastructure, they're all about the streets. Here I talk about the dark tunnel of the boulevard leading down to the site. I talk about the explosion into the light. I talk about the problems of the cars um, in front of the Roman temple. And um, many, many, sketches saying what is the site, this is not about a building, this is about a bigger picture. And the interesting thing is that we won the competition and with the support of a very sympathetic mayor, we work with the authorities and the transformation again is beyond an individual uh, building. So I draw some attention to that part of the design. This was a photograph I took um, with the Roman temple behind me all the parked cars that I'm complaining about there, um, the site in the back, which is, um, which is a car park, the, uh, the ruined colonnade has gone, and then its final transformation, 
when the building is realized and the square is addressed and the parking is addressed and the paving, um, uh, then it, it's very, very difficult at this point to say, what is this project? Is it about a building or is it about a space? Of course, the two now become very, very difficult to separate. Uh, they become one and the same because they are conceived as part of the same uh, issue, the same challenge. This was a drawing that I did um, during the design development of the scheme. It's not like this now, but, this, but in spirit it is. And, and that cutaway section shows a main route ascending as a kind of terraces within the building. Another aspect is that the public can take a direct route through the building so it becomes a shortcut. It's a faster way to get from one side of the square into another district. So, the, the, so people will enter the building not just for the facilities that it offers, but because it's a quick way across that particular part of the city. The inspiration for that cascade of stairs was very much the, um, the hill towns, the terraces of the local hill towns in, the, in that area of, of south of France. And that becomes translated in terms of cascading steps, which in this instance are cast glass, so that light is, is delivered deep into the, the lower part of the building. This building in its urban response is the same height as the surrounding buildings, which mean that there is as much accommodation below ground as above. So getting natural light deep down is very, very much a part of that. On the way up, there are galleries which serve an international audience. They also cater to the needs of a local community. But always when you finally surface on what is not the roof, but the level just below the roof, under the uh, shading, again, is the engagement with, with, with the city, the engagement with the historic square, uh, the monument, the dialogue between the old and the new and creating a space which is about celebration, is a, a kind of stage set for, uh, for civic entertainment and, uh, and celebration. If I move to another building, which in turn is a kind of cultural generator um, of regeneration, this is something called the Sage. And this is unlike Neem, which is very much about the visual arts, and that concept, very special to France, of a mediatek, um, which is about the archiving of what is special to that community, in that case very much about bullfighting. This is about music, and this um, kind of great uh, umbrella of a roof um, contains uh, a number, uh, contains a school, and it contains uh, two major performance spaces. One quite large and formal, about classical music, um, and the other about uh, jazz and folk and more impromptu gatherings. But what is, if we, if we take that roof off and we look at a model of it, here we can very clearly see the big hall and the small hall. In the middle there's a rehearsal hall. Underneath is the music school. But the important thing about this building is that it locks onto the street pattern. It creates, in effect, a new street. That red line um, follows a river bank. It's an important artery. So again, people may take that route because they want to use the facilities that the building offers, but also they can take it as a shortcut and they can use the cafe and they can then, through curiosity, maybe engage with the cultural facilities that as a building it offers. And here in this instance, uh, the camera catches a kind of public parade which snakes its way uh, through that street from one side of the, of the city uh, to the other. Uh, this is Gateshead on the weir. Um, again, the generator is culture. The location could not be more different. It's Dallas, Texas. It's a carborn society. And the project in question, which is right at the side of this freeway, seeks to engage the pedestrian domain. Um, and quite interestingly, 
even in the more extreme carbon communities of America, there is a growing awareness of the importance of redressing the balance, of addressing the, the public domain. And this project, again born out of a competition, um, is very much about addressing those issues of humanizing the city. And by clever use of bridges, this is an area, uh, is a very short walk from the heart of downtown Dallas. So it becomes a place, a kind of oasis, where city uh, dwellers and office workers will walk five or ten minutes to be able to take advantage of the facilities that this offers, notwithstanding the fact that its primary function is as an opera house. Here you can see the body of the opera house, the red shape on the right-hand side. If you go further right, that is the uh, freeway. And, um, and if we look at this in its setting, then there's a very, very strong emphasis on the pedestrian domain. Um, and, um, and this kind of grand operatic space um, inside has a finite capacity, but what is interesting is that the exterior spaces, the city spaces that we've created adjacent to the building, allows for another audience outside to be able to engage uh, through the widescreen with what is happening uh, there. Those office workers will come to the cafes uh, at lunchtime here, so there's life much, much more around the clock. It's not a kind of cultural ghetto. Um, and, um, and shade is very important, sometimes full shade, sometimes mottled shade. And here, I know it's, um, it's not the centigrade, but um, you have to believe me, 120 degrees Fahrenheit is, uh, is quite hot. Um, that drops down fairly dramatically in the dappled shade and even more dramatically um, down to 85 degrees. And one aspect of that is the evaporative cooling offered by the, by the water, which again offers an amenity and at night becomes the reflecting pool for the kind of grand operatic um, occasion. If I move again to another cultural project that, um, that seeks to work with the community of which it is a part and tries to play a role in its regeneration, as well as creating a kind of common ground, common space within that will attract the public into the museum, even if they don't have any desire or intention to visit exhibitions or shows or galleries, the likelihood is that being brought into they will be uh, perhaps introduced to new experiences, a new world. At the point that we started this project, um, which goes back um, uh, in time, the, the whole balance of, the, of this um, museum, it is the um, uh, MFA, the Museum of Fine Art in, in, in Boston. And at that point, there had been a relatively recent relatively recent in the previous 20 years, um, a Western extension. Um, and here you can see the red arrows. So that was the entrance. And there was another entrance on the axis, but the main entrances in the historic, that is the, um, was the, 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 the entrance to the Western extension, which in our view was completely throwing the original master plan which was very much about a major north-south axis and a minor east-west axis. And um, at the heart of that image, you can see a kind of large glass pavilion. And that is the public space within the building. I don't know whether I, perhaps with this indicator. Yes, that is there. This was um, uh, the, um, th that was the, the, the western entrance uh, before. And what we did is we reinstated this historic access and then opened up on that access both sides of the building. And what this image does not tell you is that this, which is an incredible park, it was the initiative of Olmsted who designed Central Park, and that had become completely kind of crime-ridden. It was a no-go area. Uh, very, very dangerous area. And the act of creating this kind of social focus 
in the heart of the building, and here we can see this great glass pavilion. Part of the project was also creating something like 25, uh, excuse me, uh, 55 new galleries, so there's a new wing. But again, I'm not trying to explain the design, I'm trying to focus on the civic aspects of it. This was the entrance opposite the Olmsted Park. So the initiative here, um, as an essentially uh, private public initiative, because the, uh, the museum is driven by private funds, made possible a partnership with the city to then transform uh, this area. So very interesting interaction between the building uh, and, the, and the spaces surrounding it. Another project which I would like just to touch on the, um, the public uh, space aspect of it, the common ground, is the Reichstag. And the, again, the space in front of that had always been symbolically uh, important since the, uh, the fall of Berlin. Um, and this was an international competition. That's what the building looked like at the time that, uh, having won the competition, we took on the, uh, the assignment. Um, I selected this diagram because it is very much explaining how this is an energy manifesto. Um, in terms of scarcity, this is about doing more with less, cutting free of fossil fuels, using biomass, uh, fuel created uh, by vegetable oil, um, of using aquifers deep underneath the building as a thermal source to store heat in the winter and to be able to recover that during the summer, um, of photovoltaics, of working with natural ventilation, creating a reflector that will push light deep into the heart of the building. It becomes symbolic of the democratic process in action. It's become very much a symbol of a unified uh, Germany, which was the object of the competition, the moving of the parliament from Bonn to a parliament that would be, um, that would respect the, uh, the amalgamation of, of, of the East into the West, into one entity. But it's also become symbolic, not just of that, but also of Berlin and also of Germany as a nation. It is essentially um, an ecological device, but it is very much about a public space which is interacting with the body politic, and, um, and that all of these elements, I should perhaps explain, um, whether it's a public space on top of the Reichstag, whether it is engaging with the city of Boston, whether it is creating public space in Hong Kong, uh, whatever these bonuses are, they were never part of the instructions to the architect. Nobody asked for them. It was we as designers, working with those who'd commissioned us, working with the cities, to add that dimension. That's a very important point. Nobody was saying, hey, you know, we want you to do a public space on top of the right side. Quite the reverse. I can remember a meeting with 65 representatives of the political parties and saying, Mr. Foster, why would anybody want to go on the roof of the Reichstag? Why would they, I mean, why would they want to take a coffee there? Of course, the process eventually did lead to acceptance of those ideas and a restaurant. The only problem then was the restaurant was so popular that we were then criticized for making a restaurant that was too small for the capacity that was needed. But that's a nice kind of problem to have. So 35 million people visited this since, here's the restaurant in question, the most overbooked restaurant in, in, in Germany. This is the roof space. And this is the great spiral that ascends to the viewing platform and through the glass floor there affords a glimpse of the body politic of the debating chamber and symbolically places the public, places society, those who are served by the politicians symbolically places them uh, above them. And this cone mirror is the great reflector that pushes the light uh, down and this is also the device that creates the wind tunnel effect, the aerodynamic effect which pulls the air through the building and reduces the, the energy load. Still on the subject of the power of a cultural institution to go beyond its, the needs of its collection 
and start to offer to something to the city of which it is a part, to give something back uh, to the city, something that will work for the institution, will ease the congestion through the galleries before we got engaged with this project. If you wanted to go to visit a gallery, you had to push your way through one gallery to get to the next gallery to get to the next gallery. The solution was ideally to be able to go in, find a central space, and go into each of the individual galleries in a very um, uh, civilized uh, way. The clues for us in terms of the future was, as always, to go back into the past. I think somebody said if you want to look far into the future, look far back. Um, and looking far back here was very much about the central space. And here you can see the great dome of the, of the library the very famous library, which relocated itself to another site, and that was one of the, um, one of the generators of the, of the competition. Interestingly, if you research backwards, you find that when the building was first built, there was no library there. It was a courtyard, it was a garden. And in the bottom right there, you can see when the architect died shortly afterwards, his brother conceived the library that would then fill that space and a lot of secondary structures then infilled between the circular library, which never had a facade. It was always buried. Here you can see that except at the top where the windows are, there's no facade. It's completely filled up. So our quest, our solution, was really to bring back the historic garden within which that library sits. And the idea then that instead of having to push and force your way through one gallery to get to the next, that you could enter this great space and choose to go into any gallery. But, and this is a very big but, the idea was that this was a space that would be available to the city out of museum hours, or tailored with special opening hours outside in the evening um, for special events, and it would be an urban shortcut. So you could walk through, no intention of going to an exhibition, walk through, walk out the other side. It's a shorter, more pleasant walk. And then the idea of putting a great uh, glass roof over that so that it was uh, able to work over the year. The logistical challenges were quite considerable because something like six million visitors a year, and we could not close um, this institution, so we had to work from below and over on the roof. And here you can see that excavation, and from the same viewpoint, its transformation. Um, if I take another viewpoint, before that took place, here were the kind of little buildings that um, had grown up over time. Um, take those away, and again, that is what you find. And then the celebration, the great events that can take place in that, in that place, sometimes related, but many, many times totally unrelated to the institution, to the museum. The glass roof that makes it possible um, is very much in the spirit of one of the individuals from whom I was privileged to learn so much, Buckminster Fuller, typical Fuller structure, with all the maxims very, very relevant in terms of today's um, present austerity, future needs in terms of finite resources, how do you do more with less? Bucky, ever the optimist and always demonstrating the benign power of technology to be able to deliver higher standards of living with less and less uh, material means. Um, I just slip this in here because, again, uh, it's a kind of homage our Beijing airport where the scale is such as the largest building in the world. I think it's the equivalent of all five terminals and another unbuilt one at Heathrow under this roof. And the roof becomes almost like a kind of artificial sky, very generous, very welcoming, and a kind of climate modifier. And very much a gathering space. The termini, as I say, the great railroad stations, the airports, the ports, um, and um, or at a... Um, 
opposite end of the scale, a river crossing, here a proposal for a pedestrian bridge, again a competition to mark the millennium across the Thames, the first pedestrian bridge uh, in its history. And um, that in my, one of my many early sketches here, conceived as a kind of blade of, of light, the most minimum intervention. Um, very contentious, um, uh, criticized at the time because it dared to be on the axis of St. Paul's. But logically, if you're going to make a river crossing, surely you're going to make the shortest crossing at right angles. And why not um, uh, conceive that uh, as celebrating uh, the cathedral and, um, and very much on, on axis? So here you can see that um, there's a a very interesting um, tools in terms of being able to monitor the effect of social change in terms of movement, ease of movement, convenience, shortcuts, short routes. Um, and that's called space syntax. It's something that, as a research tool, we've played a large part in developing, working with a group uh, originally embedded in, 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 in a university. The very, very dark um, um, uh, line is the, is the Thames here. And essentially, what this diagram is telling you is that the colder colors are not good news. Good news is when it gets really warm, when it starts to go yellow, when it goes red. That means that those routes are well trafficked, they're probably uh, safer and it gets warmer in this um, in this in this direction because this this bridge is very much about uh, feeding prosperity from the traditional rich city on the northern bank to what has always been traditionally the poorer areas on the South Bank. The South Bank was always the areas where the bordellos, interestingly also Shakespearean, the Globe Theatre, which is next to the Tate, which is on that side. So this, as a connection, has brought a tremendous amount of prosperity uh, to a relatively poor quarter of, um, of London, totally transformed it beyond everybody's expectations. Here you can see the way in which the crowds move uh, towards the Tate, and here the axis, as I described, on St. Paul's. Perhaps I've been, we've done, been privileged to do a number of projects as architects in London, and I'm frequently asked, what, what are your favorite projects? And I try to turn that question around and say, what do I think are the two most significant projects? I think the two most significant projects are not buildings. They're about public space. One um, is Trafalgar Square, um, and I think that's, um, that's a major uh, transformer. The other, in, in a lesser sense, is the bridge, but every bit as important. So interestingly, as an architect, I choose the two projects which don't involve buildings. Um, and if I move to Trafalgar Square, um, just noting that the interesting thing about this bridge is that when you are at mid-span, you have an incredible perspective of the river, something that you cannot get from any other bridge in London, unless you're fortunate enough to look after out of a passing train on one of the railway bridges. This is the area that includes Trafalgar Square. Again, it was a competition. Um, and here is the kind of yin-yang, the challenges, the conflicts. Um, so it's about improving access, which is uh, against the issues of security. Um, it's about addressing the balance between public transport and private cars, tourists and Londoners, ceremonial and everyday, and um, visual clutter against uh, legibility. Um, so these as, as issues, what is interesting is that this is now quite an old project. And it's very difficult for anybody to remember how awful Trafalgar Square was at the time of the competition. Um, the people at the bottom right, everybody would move around the outside because it was a traffic gyratory. On all four sides, uh, there was traffic. 
So people would never cross the square because it was so dangerous, so difficult. And we would do computer studies um, trying to identify what kinds of people were in the middle and identifying the traffic flows around the, around the edge. And, um, and we learned a great deal from this research. And it told us that um, even doing something very small, quite modest to this space, has incredible implications on the rest of London. And this involved something like um, observation points, nearly 170. Um, we questioned 27,000 drivers to find out where they were coming from, where they were going to. Um, we consulted 180 organizations, 10,000 uh, leaflets were distributed, there were exhibitions. Um, and a lot of, um, a lot of things, um, how can I say, surprised everybody who had written the brief. Everybody assumed that most of the people there were visitors, and everybody assumed that anybody who was resident in the area would oppose change. Interestingly, 80% supported change, and that there were more Londoners in that area than tourists, although a significant number of tourists. Even to make the smallest change of closing one road and rerouting traffic, we had to do a London-wide study, again using the space syntax techniques that I've taught. Here, very, very clearly, you can see the black line wiggling through, which is the Thames. Very, very quickly, the before and after. So here you can see that there is, this <coughs> there is this road with all the traffic whizzing through here. It was impossible to cross that, um, really life-threatening. And here you can see the way in which these steps have been introduced, and I'll show you a detail very, very shortly. Uh, there are no buildings involved. This is the minimum building interruption here. And so there is now a diagonal flow across the space. Again, if I go to the before, that was the road to the north before it was closed. That is how it is uh, now, in front of the, uh, the National Gallery and the Portrait Gallery, and the historic Hawksmoor Church uh, at the end. And here, again, you can see before, you can see the traffic in the back there, and now with the new stairs which open up. And, um, and the building elements are discreet and small, um, but the celebrations are large, um, noisy, celebratory, um, and across the, uh, the cultural divide. It is uh, now dubbed London's living room. So quite an int interesting urban uh, transformation. Move on to um, a project in, um, in India, Dharavi. And this image... Um, is of Central Park, excuse me, is of Hyde Park in London. And if I put that line around, that is the site of this, um, I suppose you would call it a favela in some societies. It's a slum area in, um, in Mumbai. And if we look at that from above, it's 175 hectares, it's one million people, very, very high um, density. And that yellow triangle there, um, imagine that the top of that yellow triangle is your eye. You're elevated in a building and you're looking out. The building is ringed in yellow and you're looking across uh, at this here. So this is the urban grain and that is the building. And um, we were asked to, um, to do a design study to recommend uh, what changes, how, um, how this um, area might be transformed, upgraded, improved. And, um, and in the process, we asked ourselves why this building, which had been built as a solution to the problems of that area, was totally...